All right. All right, all right. Let's see who shows up first. Ravi and Thomas, they're the, they're the first ones showing up. At least the first ones popping in. So welcome, everybody. Bunch of folks. Let's see if um, I recognize anybody um, from the last one. So I think we have our technical difficulties solved from last time. So I'm glad that we everybody's here. Everything's working. Fantastic. Randolph Williams. Is that the Randy Williams? That may be somebody that I know, actually. Not sure if that's you, Randy, or not. So, uh, all right. How are we doing, Jethro? Awesome. Thank you very much for asking me. How are you doing, Dave? Doing all right. And you guys, you guys are in uh, Indianapolis, right? That's correct. Yeah, just north of uh, downtown Indianapolis. Correct. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Sorry about your luck in the in the playoffs. I know that just breaks your heart. I think uh, there's uh, definitely a, a few hearts that have been broken over the weekend. Yep. One of my one of those is mine. <laughs> so this, actually, this is where I would rather be. I'd rather be at the southernmost point. That's why I chose that. Anyway. How you doing, cheating? Wonderful, Dave. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. We'll get started in just a minute. Folks are coming in. Glad that you guys uh, guys are here. Tell us where you're coming from. I'm I'm just like I said. I'm in Baltimore, give or take, just just outside Baltimore, right near CMS. Actually, about ten minutes into the countryside from CMS. That's where I am in Woodstock, Maryland. If you know where that is, you probably only know because of the snowball stand. That's a famous thing. That's the only thing we're famous for, I think. In in Woodstock is the snowball stand. So there you have it. And uh, if the folks that some folks will probably know where that is, especially the folks coming from CMS. So we will go ahead. Let me get a, let me get this sharing the screen thing going, making sure that works right. Does everybody see that? You can see All everything right. there. Thanks, Except Dave. It's not 2021. It's 2022. Somebody missed that. All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm Dave Lohan, the Gov Brief host here for today. And with, with us, we have Jethro Lloyd. He's the CEO of iLab. Say, hey, Jethro. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome. Yep, yep. And we want to welcome everybody. This is crazy. We, we love doing interagency briefings to bring information to you guys and, and to help the communication structure. I'm telling you, we got a bunch of folks that have signed up for this from all over the different federal agencies. We're glad that you decided to join us today. And we have a couple of folks that said this is the best briefing ever. Best ever now. No, no pressure. If you, get, if you get new ideas, this is from Nicole from the census. Uh, again, new ideas for how to approach integration testing through production readiness. I think we'll address some of that, huh, Jethro? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And Christine from CMS, I learned something new. Anything. Look at that. There's the bar. Best briefing ever. Anything new. There you go. Uh, Maxwell from ICE, from the OCIO with the, with the DHS, decreasing IT depend, de development failures and enhancing development. Is that in our wheelhouse or not? Uh, we're going to talk a lot about decreasing those IC, IT development failures. Absolutely. Yep. That's the theme today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Josephine from the Patent Trademark Office. There are real-time examples to relate to. Yes, yes, yes. De Dennis from VA OIT. Learn my personal goals, how to get there, and potential pitfalls. We will do the best we can with that. Not sure if, it, if it's all rolled into your own internal personal goals, but we'll do our best to try. Zo. So, from CMS, we walk away with some really tangible tools and changes. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you. Uh, and here's, so please address this. Uh, and we're either gonna do that here or we're gonna do that after this. And that is uh, from Josephine says, what is the best tool to use for automating desktop web-based systems that may that have many data dependencies? Well, we may talk about that and then give you some, some uh, insight later. We can pop something on later for you to, to talk with these folks. Lisa with the VA, value add, and meaningful metrics. We'd like to know more about what that means to you, Lisa. Jeffrey with EPA, in addition to testing for quality assurance, our mechanisms to ensure that security requirements have been met. I can tell you what, Jeffrey, that should be built into your QA, right? Jethro? Absolutely, absolutely. All right. So Laurie from Census, the security code validation and code completion, that sounds like an offline com conversation, just ready to happen. Jethro, what do you think? Absolutely, Laurie. And, and, you know, for the last two questions around quality assurance and specifics around security, 
Uh, it is something that we're going to bring into briefing later on in the year, but we do have a specific core focus around that security. We've got a lot to talk about. So if you guys are willing to talk to us separately, we can cover everything around that security stuff. Yep. And you'll do it right for him. And how much does it cost them to talk to you, Jethro? Zero. Zero. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not a blessed thing. All right. The session agenda, we'll talk, I'll give you who these guys are in just a minute. We'll talk about how you can communicate with us. We'll talk about in, agency issues and challenges and breaking the cycle of bad development. We're going to talk about several. I, mean, I, th I think we have three, right? Right, guys? Three QA automation case studies. And then we'll throughout this, we'll be doing uh, the Q&A with you guys and recommended action steps and procurement options for you and additional resources. You with your session doc, somebody on my team is gonna pop this in here where you have the briefing presentation capabilities and the case studies that we're gonna be reviewing so that you have them for you in PDF format. If you've been living under a rock and you have no idea who's, how Zoom works, you can actually make us bigger, smaller. You can even control whether you see us at all. Just go up there to the top, select what you want and make us, um, make us disappear if you want to. Uh, pre, as far as communicating throughout this chat, here's the thing. There's, there's going to be a lot of folks here. We got 45 people here. So let's do this. Let us know who you are in the chat and all that kind of stuff. And we love that. If you have a question that you want to engage us with, you can raise your hand or most, I think the best way to do it, any questions go into the Q&A. And if you have something you want to take offline, send it to katie.tucker at that email address down the bottom that you see right there. And we will be doing things like this. Why in the world did you decide to join us today? Is because you want to learn about independent QA and how it's meeting the president's requirements? Uh, do you have a software, software project that's off course? I need some insight, insight on a specific software issue. I'm in procurement and want to know why we should separate the contracts from the prime. Love that question. If you're from procurement, that's for you or my boss made me come. And we know there's Weisenheimers out here that are gonna pick that one and you can pick as many as you like. While you're doing that, I'm gonna tell you about this particular briefing so that you can actually communicate because if you don't know this, then you can't communicate. And that is, this event is not affiliated or endorsed by GSA or any agencies provided to you, the audience for informational purposes only. And your participation as government personnel is voluntary and any engagement, like I said, by you is not an indication or endorsement to purchase from any vendor, including iLab. So now that we got that out of the way, uh, Jethro, tell us a little bit about iLab, how you guys got started and who you serve. Great. Thank you, Dave. So iLab's uh, been operating globally and, and specifically starting out in uh, South Africa, but uh, headquartered now in the United States, uh, uh, the better half uh, of the late 90s. Uh, and we started because of the, the, the great software event that occurred towards the end of the 90s, the big Y2K. The, oh, yeah. the, the big the, the big date challenge that everybody dealt with. And I think it was at that stage was the first time that agencies and organizations like the people on this call were thinking about, well, if I'm buying expensive software, how do I make sure whether I buy it or build it? How do I make sure it's working to what I wanted it to do, what it had to deliver for me? Was it delivering to my constituents, my clients, or whatever it might be? So Really, our focus, and, and specifically here in the United States, we help the agencies deploy and very importantly, maintain software, whether they've bought it or built it, or they've done a combination of both. Um, we have in the United States, probably over 3000 plus completed engagements across the public and private sector. Uh, we are deemed, which is fantastic. The United States is such a big, beautiful, wonderful place, a small business. And we headquartered in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I live uh, with, with my family. Um, our industries that we serve, public sector, which is what we're talking about today. We have vast experience there, financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, pharmaceutical banking, telecommunications, and re uh, uh, retail. So we've got that great experience we bring to the public sector because we've been exposed to so many different um, agencies. More, what is our core focus? Independent quality assurance and testing. And last time, Dave, we had a, we had a guy that spoke up. He said, quality assurance is different to testing. Absolutely. What do we do? We help clients mature what they're doing from a software asset management perspective, whether it be bought or built, as well as we do the core activity of testing. Everything from unit testing right through to the big problem that many agencies have, user acceptance testing, how are they 
taking on these big software projects and, and, and having the bottleneck that is being created. So independent, we do manual, we do a significant amount of automation, performance testing, and we also do security. There's some questions around security. We're not covering it in this presentation, but we can definitely answer all those last two questions, Dave. They were asked by those two uh, 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 individuals from, from the agencies. We can definitely help with that specifically. But today the focus is, is I'll try to touch a little bit on security, but we focus on everything except for security, but the principles remain exactly the same. Yep, yep. And you can see why this is so important to folks. The first is the modernization, right? That we're here because these acts are coming down on top of folks. And, and unlike the private sector, when the president says, hey, this is the memorandum, boom, it becomes, bo that's exactly what has to happen, right? So we have that, we cybersecurity right here. We have it saying, hey, this is what's coming down on everybody's head. And decreasing the IT development failures and enhancing the development, that is it. That is all part of that. And we really want to break this cycle because we've seen it happen over and over and over again where something gets developed it gets pushed out and there's failures and some of those are catastrophic failures with billions of dollars being spent that are just gone they just it'll it, it just never works so this is why the usds has created the playbook right and they have in the playbook and we're, we're highlighting two of these one, one of them is four which is build the service using agile right, and iterative practices, and this fits right into that, and automate the testing and deployments, right? So all this gets funneled into that so that you can reduce the risk, lower the total cost of ownership, and most of all, most of all, folks, protect your agency's reputation. Because guess what? That is the number one thing that gets damaged when you have an IT failure. We don't have to go far. We don't have to rehash the past, but we've all seen this over and over again where we have these big releases and huge failures, right? And this is the impact on your agency. It delays things. And, and your customer experience, also known as your citizen experience, whoever it is that you are, you are doing this with, and it the, it increases the time. All of this goes goes into uh, increasing the costs, and everybody loves that negative press, right? So there you have it. Where and we had some folks that say, "Hey, we released this thing, and boom, it goes." It, we'll see. We'll see if anybody's released something and and had something negative. So this is what happens with modernization failures, right, Jethro? Absolutely. Yep. And just to add, Dave, a, a, another massive impact to the agencies is the never-ending change requests. Hey, from your vendors the we thought it was done we we look at the software that's produced and it isn't done and then we go back to the drawing board and we draw another change request and a project that should have taken two years takes four yep. and the project that should have cost 10 million costs 40 so we're really there to try assist with some of those those challenges and we see this right so tell take us through this wheel here of of how failures happen so I think the the first and most important concept that we wanna we wanna bring to the table here is the independence. So if we take that wheel, if that would be a, a standard sort of cycle, whether you're buying software or you're building it, you go through a whole process of your architecture and procurement, and then from a procurement perspective, you sort of hand the build, deploy, test, identify, fix, initiate all those sort of activities to a single vendor, the same vendor or the same individuals that are required to build it. What ends up happening is somewhere along the line, they split off what they're responsible, what you're responsible for. And the agency ends up becoming quite, quite majorly responsible for things like test, identifying the defect, and then being able to articulate that problem back to the vendor for a fix. That, that cycle over there becomes the finger pointing activity. Thank you, that's a great graphic. The finger pointing activity of the two organizations saying, I think, this doesn't meet what I said it was supposed to do. And the vendor is saying, no, that's exactly what you said it was supposed to do. And the reason being is because you're using business folk or folk that have day jobs to go through this testing initiative. Are they the experts in their business? Absolutely. But testing is a formal, formal practice, something we need, need to train. If we look back in history, in the 80s, we weren't formalizing what we did from a testing perspective. The private sector realized that failure in the industry and started to develop and initiate a formal QA or testing role within organizations because the activities, the, the processes that are followed, the methodology need to be adopted. Now today, 
if you're not deploying automation testing early on in your cycles, you never get the benefit of regression. You never get the benefit of being able to release software. So the lack of quality assurance, and independent testing validation, okay, creates those challenges between you and the vendor and that never ending cycle. And worst case, that press moment, the time when somebody phones you from a reporter that says your system doesn't work, there was some kind of disaster. So what does independent mean? It's not you. It's not you and it's not your vendor. And it's not IVNV. Because I think, uh, Dave, do you agree? We get some of those questions. They say, yep, what yep. is the difference between this and IVNV? IVNV is validating that the vendor has completed the right processes that they said that they were going to process, that there is an activity like project management. It's part there of is it, right? Active. It is definitely part of it. And we work as an organization like ourselves, ILAP, we actually work hand in hand with many IVNV vendors. Uh, the role that they play and the role that we play is very, very different. So, do, is, Dave, do you want to carry on? No, I'm, I was just going to ask the question. So, or, it's not, and it's not just code, it's the processes and the code. So, it's understanding Correct. the agency processes and the code as it applies to make sure on behalf of the agency, based on what you ask for, is are you getting the deliverable that you're paying for? But it's but it's validating it with an audit trail. It's validating it in a formal method to create test cases that are repeatable and used in your maintenance. Because Dave, the other big thing is when you buy and build a piece of software and you inter uh, engage in and put it into production, that piece of software, whatever it do, whether you're buying a Salesforce application and, 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 and making configuration changes to answer some component of interaction with your constituents, the reality of the situation is that software will continually change. You will continue to add legislation changes. There'll be laws that will impact how you do your business with your software. There'll be activities and events that occur from a technology perspective. People's mobile phones will change. Maybe you're releasing a mobile application that allows people to, to do things differently. And coming out of a post-pandemic or somewhere in between this, this pandemic, the reality is that governments are being forced harder and stronger to modernize and to put a lot of their services into a cloud environment or an online environment, et cetera, which is adding a significant amount of risk, significant amount of change. How are you managing this? Yep. The, at the beginning, we spoke about the difference between quality assurance and testing. Testing is the activity that validates whether or not the software works, okay, under a specific set of conditions, whether it be a unit test, which is, speaks to the unit level, whether it be user acceptance, which speaks more towards the business process. The quality assurance elements that we bring to the table is we give a significant amount of feedback, feedback and insight into some of the challenges we identify because of the symptoms that we see, which is a defect. So yeah. if we start identifying, for instance, that at the, the business level, the way in which you are articulating a use case, a user story, a business requirement, whatever you want to call it, and the way you're engaging with your vendor, we help the organization make those improvements. And that's the quality assurance component. Remember, our independence and our lack of vesting into a vendor giving you a piece of software is the power that we bring you because we right. represent the agency. We do not represent the, 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 the vendor. We're yep. looking at process and code. We're protecting you, the agency. But the most important thing is we're doing the right amount of testing, the right amount right, of quality assurance to mitigate the risk. Not more, not less. Yep. Love it. Love it. Love it. And so we talked about how it fails, but now if we move testing forward and we're procuring this at the same time that you're procuring whatever it is, but it, it, this doesn't just apply to, to something that's, that's custom made, right? Right, Jethro? Absolutely. So we see a lot in the, in, in, in the public sector, the desire to buy everything from a single vendor, the single vendor procurement. There's great value in it. I do not um, dispute the value in it. But there's a component that you can carve out, which is the testing and some of the elements of quality assurance that you can procure independently that gives you a little bit more assurance as to what's happening. It also introduces some of your controlled testing much earlier in the cycle. So when the, 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 the vendor is producing some kind of build, we assist the organization with defining what should be the test evidence that they providing the agency that they've done certain amount of testing before they're releasing it into a pre-production environment or 
the cloud environment for UAT or whatever it might be, okay, that they're showing that level of evidence. Then we would help go through the testing that the agency is responsible for or more, depending on the engagement, we'll show some different case studies. Um, but more importantly, we can give logical, uh, uh, technical level enough response to the vendor so that they can make the fix. And why do we want to do this early on? We said at the beginning, the most important thing about testing or any quality assurance activity is that the earlier on you do it, the cheaper, cheaper it is, the more likely is you're going to save money on your deployment. If you go further down the line, if you're only starting testing at the end, the cost of fixing those things are massive. And in many instances, Dave, myself and Chaitin, who've been doing this for many years, we can tell you we've worked on more projects where we've gotten involved, where we're involved too late and the vendor and the, and the, and the um, um, client or, or, or the person we're representing ends up in a litigious relationship because it's been an absolute and unadulterated failure and it's too late to find it. The way we also do this now with good technology, and there was a question around what are the tools? I think there were some questions around tools. The problem with that answer is that is in itself is a long answer. There are many pieces of technology or different types of technology. ILAB, we have partnerships with the likes of companies like Tricentis and Microfocus. We work with uh, uh, products like Selenium on the automation side. So we also believe in introducing technology as early on as possible mm -hmm. because, Dave, we know applications get bigger and more complicated and you can't hire armies of people to test this. So the best way to do that is introduce automation for repetitive tests for your aggression as early on as possible. And there was a question around security. What we do is we institute some of the security practices into some of those automated tests to validate that we haven't created any kind of vulnerabilities in the application due to the changes we made. And that's part of that, that regression. And then there's obviously specific security tests that one needs to fulfill each and every single time you do a release or any kind of major release. So we've got stories around that. So I apologize to the individual that asked around the tools. I would love to spend some time with you separately. The tools conversation is a big conversation. There's cheap ways of sorting out a problem that's very specific. And then there's enterprise kind of ideologies that one should think about in relation to your overall quality assurance and testing. Yep. And we can certainly help in that, in that regard. And I think one of the things is kind of applies to, to failing, failing on small things as opposed to big things and failing Correct. fast, right? The faster you fail, it's actually a good thing, right? Yeah. So Dave, we had a great question from a, from a public sector client that's involved with the uh, license plates and registrations and that for one of the states that we work in. And uh, the question was, well, we went through a lease and there were a significant amount of defects. And my answer is yes, we caught them. So the, the relativity of what we're doing is a good thing. We found those defects. Yep. You, A, we found them. B, you know what they are and you can act on that. And C, most importantly, they went live on time because they sure as hell, if it was a defect, was significant amount early on in the process, they weren't going to go out and release that into production and figure that out when it's too late. So they were able to fix it cheaply because it was found early. That's exactly it was, right. And that, if it was found later down, that's very expensive. Yep. And you look here, when you do that, you, you mentioned it. Automate those, those tests. They can be automated. You build it into yeah. it and you test it throughout. And that's where you get to here, where instead of spending your time on all of those fixes after the fact and the incredible costs that are, that are involved in that, you go, you can apply the money to your maintenance, to your improvements, to reallocating your, your whole entire workforce that would be, that would be absolutely bogged down Correct. by, by what happens in a, in a monumental failure. Right. And and that's where you get to the, the anatomy of a success. You're saving your dollars, you're saving your reputation, saving money on resources as well as your resources. Most importantly, boom. That's a John Madden term, right? Boom. I like that, Dave. Just to add to that, you know, besides cat catastrophic failures, the reality is catastrophic failures are uh, a thousand small failures. That's right. And, and I always speak to a lot of your software initiatives. It's debt by paper cut. So... We, we got involved once with an eligibility system. They were three years down the line. They died over three years of paper cuts. When they eventually got to the point where they got, it was three years of small paper cuts. It was three years of two-week change requests and three years of missed requirements and three years of misunderstood requirements and three years of defects in production. So by the time it got to the catastrophic failure, 
and they had to reorganize and reshift and respend millions of dollars. The reality is that bullet went off its trajectory right early on in the in the life cycle. And we try to help organizations keep that, keep you on your trajectory for success. And that's what that's what independence does. It gives you the ability to speak directly to the situation and ultimately reduce the project cost. And that's not just project costs for custom code, that's project costs for COTS systems as well, right? Dave, 80% of our clients are buying software off the shelf and spending two years implementing it. Um, the reality is they're buying software off the shelf and they're making two years of changes to a software. We don't focus on the software, we're focusing on the software that will become owned by the vendor, by the client, should I say. Yeah. They're making specific configuration changes, specific integration changes, specific unique enhancements to deliver their business. Great. And that's great, what we focus on. Great, great setup. And you can see the things, instead of being a negative on the, the left side of being a failure, it turns into the success when you do these things. Um, and I don't want to, we don't have to read all those. You can see them, but the reliability and performance, super huge. Um, <laughs> user experience. Big, big, big deal. There's so much coming down the pipe for user experience improving that. So all of this, all this gets solved by those those little failures and little improvements that keep you on track where you're not 10,000 miles off course because you waited till the end. Fantastic. I love it. I love it. We're going to do a poll real, real quick to say, what is your biggest modernization issue? And this could be a modernization issue. It could just be a project issue, right? Is it death by change request? Love that. Never ending story of defects. Business resources are the roadblock, meaning that once you get sucked down into one of these big things, right? And I went live and made the news. I want to see if anybody has the has had that happen or or uh, that's the, that's one of the big ones. My sanity, obviously. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's see. Let's see. We, we've addressed some of the questions. Anybody have any questions? You can pop them in the Q and A, and we'll be glad to to uh, to hit those. I'm going to open the chat, and Mia says, "I know that snowball stand. I know Mia's probably uh, running back and forth either to Social Security Administration or CMS because the back way from Howard County." comes down there and that's why she knows the snowball stand. So awesome for that. And if you have any questions, please ask them. We're gonna get into some case studies now, which will probably spur on some additional questions, um, but great job on, on addressing some of those uh, early on questions, Jethro. And we'll let, leave this open for just a minute, just in case I don't see anybody. We must be doing either a great job or everybody's in a coma, Jethro, I don't know. You're muted. I have no idea. What I, hope not. I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. So, uh, Karen, raise your hand. Hang on a second. Karen, let me see if I can find you, attendees. Come on. Come on, Karen. Where are you? Karen, is it Karen Earl? Is that who it was? Or some? maybe the, did the hand go down? I don't see the hand anymore. All right. Well, tell you what, if you if you if you want to chat, just let us know. I'm going to end this poll in three, two, one and boom. All right. Cool. Thank you very much for that. So uh, sorry, oh, Dave, on. it is Karen Earl. She did say yes. Karen Earl. Hold on a second. Before we jump into this, Karen Earl, let me find you. Uh, Karen, I don't know how it, it went up and went down, but it, it worked. All right. Here we go, Karen. You there? Whoop, go ahead. Sorry, I just hit I hit it to ask you to unmute and I muted you. Go ahead. You there, Karen? She's coming. I know it is. What happened there? One more time. I'll ask you to unmute. Let's see. She's not, I don't know what's happening there. If you want to type the question in, uh, Karen will definitely get to it. Definitely want to hear what you what you have, or you could just you could just start talking, because I I have you if you can find your microphone and unmute it you can do that because we'll keep that open for you, just in case gave you the permission to, um, and then so so take us through while while we're Karen's figuring that out we'll do our best to get to you Karen right after this spot, so the quality assurance approach whether this is independent or not right this is but this talks about the the approach itself so tell us how that works. 
So I think there was a question early on. Somebody was asking for meaningful metrics. I think uh, metrics or measures. I think the most important thing to understand about any quality assurance approach is each and every single phase that one completes in your project life cycle, there needs to be a reason or a measurable metric to say that you've been successful. Mm -hmm. With the testing, it's, it's easy. We talk to number of test cases produced, test cases in relation to um, story points de delivered, if it's, if it's a sort of a semi-agile approach or whatever it might be. Um, we speak to number of defects found, what are the types of defects, the analysis, severities. We put a significant amount of metrics and monitoring against everything you do from a testing perspective. But quality assurance pushes that all the way up, up the food chain, further up earlier on in that process. And you ultimately, con going through a continuous monitoring and improvement perspective, because you ultimately with software, the dream is to move into a continuous integration, continuous um, um, deployment type of environment where when, you, when you're working within your software, you're continually making changes. You're not having these singular moments in time when you're doing something, you're doing something on a continuous basis. And as more and more of the organizations move to a cloud type environment or a, 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 a sort of a hosted sort of environment with their software, more and more of this becomes a reality that things move faster um, in smaller cycles and shorter sprints, et cetera. You need to start including and approaching quality assurance much earlier on in that process. So we're, uh, that, that is obviously a simple, simple circle. And that's really what we're trying to describe there. Yep. Yep. And all this, what we're there, we have three different case studies here and these are in your handouts as well. Right. So if you go to the, to the, to the link, that Dropbox link will take you to the web. Doesn't take you into, you know, super secret categories of Dropbox or anything like that. It goes to the overall and you can, uh, you can grab those from the web. So the first one here is department of transportation. Tell us what the problem was and tell us how you fixed that problem or how that problem was fixed. Through. Super. So, so this was, um, this was a, a, a very rare occasion where an organization fundamentally has a software problem that equates to then a class action and a lawsuit. Uh, and they lost their lawsuit and the class action was around excessive fees that were, that were charged because a change was made in the software because all their fees are calculated by their software. A change was made in the software and went out into production. It was obviously an embarrassment for the governor within that state. Those don't happen all the time, but really we were able to fix what the major newsworthy event was. But what we've really worked with them fundamentally is, and they're in a unique position that they've got a very large core application that they've developed over a number of years and they've bolted on COTS solutions in support of everything they do from a business. There's now, there nobody in the federal government that has ever done, anything, ever done anything like that, Jethro. Just saying. Absolutely, absolutely not. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what we had to do for them is they have a significant amount of changes right through the year, but specifically towards the end of the year where they have to put in very large legislative changes that have an impact on taxes and fees, as well as endorsements, types, et cetera. So there's a significant amount of changes that happen on an annual basis. One of the biggest and most significant changes occurred was some of the laws that had to change in handling COVID-19, okay? During the pandemic, there were certain allowances that were afforded. They had to implement those allowances. And then here's the cool part, Dave, they had to roll that all back. They had to put it in and take it out when the law was in and when the law was out, okay? So there's all that law stuff. Then there's their absolute desire to modernize or take the application stacks, as I said, the custom developed and all the other stuff, on a journey where they're moving things more online, more mobile, allowing the less dependence on branch or human-to-human -human interaction. They've got kiosks. They've got big terminals where people can do a whole series of events. So they're modernizing also at the same time. So what did we do? The first thing that we did was we got testing involved much earlier on in the process, okay? Each and every single time a user story is defined, we are defining use cases or test cases and the developers are starting to build their code. So we're an integrated uh, agile team. We help them transition to agile de development and we, build, we built automation in as early and as possible so that we could reduce regression time. Now, why is regression time important, Dave? The regression time is important is because it's a hell of a complex application. 
I think there was a question around an online system with lots of data dependencies. Yep, this yep. is a living example. It's an online system with a significant amount of data dependencies. One variable change in the data, it calculates a different tax rate, a different uh, a fee rate, a different outcome, a different piece of paper that's required to support it. So the processes, the individual independent processes are very, very complicated. So we had to automate all of that, okay? We reduced that time from a four-week exercise to now it happens every single week at the end of each week, at the end of each sprint cycle, okay? A full end-to-end -end regression test, pushing through to right through to a smoke test, okay? And we spoke about that post-release production testing. We're pulsing that application in production all the time. We find defects so early on in the process that they have very clear very clear insight into the impact of those changes before they release to production. What's changed from before and after? When they have a release date, they make their release date, nobody's working on weekends, no software is pulled back, and every single change that they want to make to this piece of software, if they're able to scope it in from a development or integration perspective, they can deliver it each and every single time. Fantastic. So that that's a Department of Transportation one. This one is this has to do with retirement. There's several different retirement agencies in the federal yeah. government. So take us through this one. So the retirement agency was a great one. Another great example. They had no event that was a problem. They didn't have any challenges. They didn't make the news. But the reality is they realized that they weren't necessarily as efficient as they could be. They do not do custom development. They have an Oracle application. They have a PeopleSoft application so they've got applications that they've procured that they've now configured for their environment but they deal with a lot of money they deal with a lot of money they deal with a lot of people we initially got involved with them during a modernization effort they had a significant amount of people to people interaction they had old retirees who were going into specific branches etc and they wanted to modernize it during that modernization project, what they started to realize was there was massive inefficiency in how they were doing things, finding defects too late. They weren't able to understand the impact of a change on the environment early on, okay? So the reality is what we did was we have, and, and I think somebody asked about metrics, with this organization, we deliver our entire service against a set of measures. One of the most important measures that we deliver against is 100% or all defects are found before they promote it into production. Their CIO said, I do not want any defects in production. I want an application that works always according to what we expect it to do. So we have matured their environment. We have moved and shifted our entire testing effort all the way as close to development effort as possible, or should I say the configuration effort as possible. We have automation across uh, a significant amount of their critical functions and workflows. And those are executed regularly and often under multiple data and environment conditions to ensure that they do not have. Now, I think a lot of people are thinking, well, this could be quite expensive. Well, actually it isn't, okay? The reality is many of these testing activities that we're talking about are currently being done badly or not enough of. And what the difference in the two case studies, which was very important is, there are no change requests happening in client number one that we spoke about. In client number two, not only aren't there change requests, but they're able to make reinvestments back into their environment because they're not living, fail, living through failure. They're living through success. They're meeting the objectives and they're able to do more with their budgets that have been given to them. So the investment that they're making, their return on investment and spending this money on testing has been that reduction in overall cost of ownership of these applications, both in production or during the build phases. I love it. And then we have just a, there's just a little bit of health stuff happening in the federal government, just a little, just not, little not too much, Jesse. So, 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 so obviously- don't, try, don't spend too much time on this, but just no, a little. I, I won't because I think we hear enough of it in the news on a regular basis. <laughs> but I think I think the most important thing here was um, the, the, this Department of Health environment was a non-conversation with all due respect until uh, uh, January of, of, of 2020. No, nobody was talking about anybody in the Department of Health. For all intents and purposes, <laughs> um, you know, it, it was a non-exec event. And all of a sudden, everybody took their flashlights and pointed on the Department of Health. In this particular organization, um, we had to ramp up testing and automation efforts because releasing 
software quickly in a life critical. And I say life critical because although people maybe wouldn't die if they couldn't schedule their vaccine or wouldn't die necessarily if, if, if they couldn't know where to schedule the vaccine, in the heightened emotional state that people were at, the last thing the state wanted to do was release a piece of software um, that people were with needed, needed to rely, needed to rely on the government. This is when the government needed to step up for them. And then it failed. So what did we do? We knew that we had multiple scenarios that we had to test. We knew that it was very data-driven, very oriented. And it was the underlying piece of software is this piece of software that works. It's, it's, it, it works around the world. Um, but they had changed it for this, this requirement being the vaccine and the contact tracing and all this good stuff. So um, we implemented a team. We, we broke down the testing down to its lowest component. We implemented tools, the environment, and the teams to support them. And we were able to automate as quickly and often so that they were able to do regression testing all the time because the rules changed. Um, uh, we were lucky to get involved in some of the application stacks when it was 85 and over. And we were able to use a smaller base. We also did performance testing to make sure that lots of people could get on the system at the same time. And as obviously, as more and more, as more and more people open up to the vaccine, so there were more constituents accessing the application, we were ready. We were ready because the system was already robust. By the time we got to the 55 and older, which was a very big constituent base, the system was running and it was successful and they were able to manage it. In parallel with that, they saw the value in what we were doing there. And we got involved with other applications that the Department of Health in this particular state works in, namely birth and death certificates. They were modernizing their birth and de death certificate applications, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This organization started primarily at a project and all three of them did the same, where there was a specific need and event that they were concerned of. What we try and encourage organizations is every piece of value that we bring to a project or program of work from a testing and quality assurance perspective, we try and encourage you to take a organization stance in that, in that there is massive value applying all of this to across all your systems and not one specific system. And that's what this department has done now. They've applied this across all their software they're responsible for. They've repeated this rigorous approach. They've repeated the good benefits and values that they get out of testing across all their systems, not specifically something where somebody has only one focus on or, or where there was a great spotlight. Um, and that's all I have to say about this one. Thank you, Dave. All right, fantastic. Well, I love it, man. So the key takeaways here, moving the QA testing forward. And, and whether, you're, whether you're using iLab or not, the idea of moving them forward up there eliminates your overall deployment failure. And again, we've seen this happen so many times. We wouldn't be here talking about this if this wasn't a huge issue for agencies, especially in enormous launches that we've seen fail, right? And, and it protects your agency, saves you dollars, faster deployment, no more finger pointing. There's one throat to choke. Whose throat do they choke when they come after something? Jethro, if you're running. Uh, if we run it, the good news is they don't need to choke any throats because <laughs> they, they're making mistakes and they're fixing it. That's there the big go. thing. They're not getting to the, oh my goodness, look at all these mistakes. Now let's go choke somebody's throat. Yep. So we're helping them prevent that at the event. And real important, you want to do this in independent testing. You want to procure the independent testing when you award the COTS or custom system development. That way it's working in parallel. I love that. I love that analogy. You guys are working together. You're integrated in the agile uh, agile development process. And then it gets automated and it doesn't cost them a mother and fortune to fix it, right? So uh, independent QA helps you meet the USDS recommendations. And that's exactly what we want to make sure that we help you do. And uh, this question is semi, semi selfish, but we want to know, if, if, do you expect an organizational transformation requirement? When do you expect this? When do you expect the QA requirement to come? Now, Q2, Q3, Q4 are not sure, and that's okay. And would you like to talk to somebody on iLab's team? I said, you don't have to purchase from anybody, including iLab, but let's, it, let's, uh, let's open back, this back up to, uh, for this. So we'll keep that open for a minute. Let us know when you have that, that requirement for quality assurance. Some folks have it right away. Karen, did we get you to, to get unmuted here? Can you unmute yourself? 
so we can get to your question. And anybody else that wants to, to, to chat, we can. The uh, the quality assurance, I mean the quality assurance, Q&A. <laughs> you can open the Q&A uh, and, and we can talk about that. I do have a, a question that came uh, that came around the other way. Um, uh, all right, so- Karen, the, Karen uh, is saying her, the poll testing is not operating. The poll testing is not operating. We didn't. We didn't test that, Karen. We didn't test that. I got people answering it. <laughs> I'm not sure who's answering. It. Maybe no. We didn't. We are not responsible for Zoom's uh, quality assurance. All right. So, so Karen, can you can you uh, unmute and we can talk or not? Uh, the the there was a question you mentioned. Uh, you mentioned security being able being able to keep. You know, being able to work with security, will that be a briefing or will that be a one on one? So it can be either one, right? Where we, we can do a briefing on this in the future with security, or is it going Both. to be one on one with them? Both. I, I recommend the one on one because the reason why in our organization we've, we've isolated testing out of these specific sort of operational QA and quality assurance and testing is because um, it, it's, it's in itself a very large discipline and in itself a separate. We, we, we have it as a separate business unit within our organization because most clients will come to us and make us do uh, assessments and vulnerability assessments into what they're doing. We also believe that we can deploy it as part of your aggression testing. So make uh, some of those security uh, um, elements as part of you. One of the big things that we do within ERP applications is we speak about rights access and data access and some of those data elements from a security perspective. When we talk about the the baddies coming in from the outside, that's a whole that's a whole other discipline and a, and a separate briefing that we will do. Awesome, love it, love it. Now, Karen, I promoted you to a panelist, so I I might have just set myself up for this was pre qual pre QA testing. I, I promoted you. I think you can unmute yourself now. If you can't, <laughs> I did really. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I can't. It may have been when you were trying Hello? to, there she is, Hello? it works, it yes. works. All right, Karen, who are you with and and, wh and what are you, wh where are you located? You there? I'm with Defense Logistic Agency. Awesome. Um, I work with a Defense Contracting Services Office here in Richmond, Virginia. Awesome. And I'm taking this as a learning um, lesson because we have a lot of, um, IT thing that comes through and um, I don't know a lot about IT um, but I'm just here um, trying to gather information about the dynamics of how IT is um, groomed through contracting. Mm. So are you in are you a are you a, a contracting officer? I'm a contract specialist. You're a contract specialist. Fantastic Karen thanks for doing what you do especially with DLA. Um, and I know exactly where Thank you are because I've been there many times. So, um, if so, this is so this applies to why you should separate the contracts and do this independently. Is that the idea? Well, I'm just here, just getting information. To be honest, um, okay. I'm not, not really. Not, I figure like this is more for an IT person. Yes. Um, but I'm just interested in you know understanding some parts of it. I don't expect to understand all parts of it, but it is helpful towards what I do with my job and which is um, do a lot of um, purchases for IT software and hardware, um, different things like that. So it just gives me a general idea of what the IT department, you know, looks for and what they go through. Um, I'm not really trying to be on, well, to be honest, I'm not really trying to learn it intricately, but it's just something good to know. Well, you know, for, that's not, I love, first of all, thank you for being here because what this does for you is when you see something come through, you might say, Hey, I pipe this up to, to the, to the program person. You're not going to make the decision. Your, your responsibility is different than the person that's going to be implementing the software Definitely. packages, right? So, Definitely. so thank, thank you for being here and thank you for be for your desire to learn because you're going to be helping your aid, protect your agency, by the way. If you say, hey, do you want to 
should we be also in, putting out a, an independent quality assurance for this? And that'll probably blow your program manager's mind if you ask that question. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Well, well, thank you so much and, and feel free to, uh, to pop back up with any questions that you need to. Uh, and we will get, uh, I'm gonna end this poll. Thank you very much for participating in the polls, folks. And we're gonna get into, uh, as I mentioned before, you, you are under no obligation to purchase from iLab, but that doesn't mean you can't. And these folks have a GSA contract. They have partners that they can run th through things through, right, Jethro? If Absolutely. you need a socioeconomic cert certification for a socioeconomic set aside, and you're a contracting specialist or contracting officer like Karen is, this is what matters to them. So uh, there's your DUNS, your CAGE, all of those types of things to be able to purchase. As part of this, you will get a, a, an email recap by the end of the day, which has this video, as well as the presentation. There will be a second uh, uh, email that comes out, which where we make it a little bit prettier and nicer and any additional information that is collected from you to be able to include for the rest of everybody else that was here. We wanna make sure that we do that. And if you would like to meet with uh, someone on Jethro's team at iLab, you can, there'll be a place to be able to do that. And with that, I'm gonna just say thanks to everybody for coming. Jethro, uh, as usual, spectacular, spectacular, great, great information. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. You bet. And uh, Deborah says thank you. So Deborah's, we thank say you, welcome. Deborah. <laughs> everybody else who doesn't say thank you, you're not welcome. But uh, yeah, we appreciate you guys. Any any parting comments for everybody, Jethro? No, thank you so much for your time. We know how busy everybody is. Happy New Year. I hope 2022 is a, a brilliant and fabulous year for every single person on this call and all their families. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jethro. Thanks for everybody for being here.